Good afternoon. Welcome to all of you. I'm Dave Ferguson, Dean of the College, and it's good to see so many of you here for what promises to be a really outstanding lecture. You're here on a special day. This is the Sappenfield Lecture, uh, named for the fun founding dean of our college, uh, Charles Sappenfield. So Charlie was an architect, uh, but uh, not only of the built environment, of the culture of our college. He was the one that had the original vision for how this college might come together from essentially nothing. And uh, we were the first school in the state, um, other than a, a small one in the northern part that we won't mention. <laughs> and, uh, in a, and so Charlie set a precedent at, in this college for combining design and theory and community involvement in a very special way that we do it here at Ball State. And uh, it was Charlie who never hesitated to pick up the phone and call well-known colleagues from across the country to come speak to our students. And so in, in that spirit, um, uh, some donors stepped up and said, let's, let's name one of the lectures the Sappenfield Lecture. So Charlie passed away in 2013, but he lives on in so many of our memories and in our tradition here at CAP of bringing distinguished practitioners to campus as Sappenfield lecturers. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah, Sarah Keogh, who will tell you about today's guest lecture. Uh, hello, everybody. So it is my honor today to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Katie Swenson, um, whose work explores uh, how critical design practice can effectively promote um, economic and social equity, environmental sustainability, and healthy communities. Uh, Katie won the Excellence in Public Service Award from the AIA in 2021. Uh, she has served as a principal at Mass Design Group since 2020. Um, and I know everybody in here has heard of Mass Design Group. We're all familiar. But how many of you know what Mass stands for? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Okay, so model of architecture serving society. I love that. Um, I think it resonates really well some, with some significant aspects of our program here. Um, and with Katie's focus on service and society, you won't be surprised to hear that the title of one of the two books that she published in 2020 uh, is titled Design with Love um, at Home in America. The other book is In Bohemia, A Memoir of Love, Loss, and Kindness. Um, at the end of this lecture, we will be giving copies of those books away to some lucky attendees. Um, but right now, please join me in welcoming Katie Swenson. Thank you. I think my mic is live. Is that right? Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Let's get started. Okay, here we go. A model of architecture serving society. We're aspirational, all of us here in this room. I'm so pleased to be here with you tonight. In my final year of architecture school, I heard the term community architect for the first time. I had never heard those two words together, and something in me immediately lit up. Whatever this thing that was called a community architect, well, that is exactly what I wanted to be. For me, I've always been a house and home person, a designer by profession, also a mother, a builder, a citizen seeking justice, working with architects seeking dignity. For myself and my family, but also for my community and for all people inextricably. I am also a writer, and writing helps me understand the world. So this journey today is going to take place in three acts in the form of three books. The first is in Bohemia, one that is very personal, a memoir about love and grief, a house and its people. The second is Design with Love, that seeks to understand how to center love in design through a commitment to empowering local residents to demand high-quality housing in low-income communities. And the third is Justice's Beauty, written by my colleagues at Mass Design Group, 
an idea to create a vision for the future of architecture itself, where beauty is design, defined by justice, and where the object of architecture, design, sustainability, is the dignity and sanctity of human, anim, animal, and ecological life. I like to call myself a homemaker. Not homemaker, lowercase, all one word, almost surely a female who manages the affairs of the household. But homemaker, capital H, capital M, two words, a maker of homes, an architect perhaps. Traditionally, almost, or at least still, 80% male. A designer of homes, the ultimate architectural expression perhaps, or maker of social housing, ad advocate for the fundamental right of housing. With this call for homemaking today, I am trying to resolve within myself and within the profession of architecture the divide between the concept of home and the concept of housing. Because while home can be a building, home is also a concept, a feeling, a place, a space. It's a dream, a political inclination. The form and style of home is immaterial, perhaps but the fact of its necessity is immutable. Home is the place where we get to know ourselves. It's the place where we live with our families, our identity, material, financial, emotional. Housing, however, seems to be something else. It's something that we architects make for others. I think this sort of divide, the personalization of what is important to you in your life, and the abstraction of what architecture is, that this is in some ways at the root of the difficulties that our profession is facing today. Architecture is for the rich, for institutions, everything else is just building. I'm going to try to use a rhetorical device that I learned from Marshall Gans at the Harvard Kennedy School in a class called Public Narrative. He urges speakers to start first with the story of self, so I'm going to speak from my personal perspective, then go to the story of us. And I hope that we here in this room together can find common ground today, bring us together with some shared values. And then I'm going to move to the story of now, hoping that we can develop a shared call for action. In the United States, we have some 40 million people who are housing insecure. There are as many as 2.5 million people, including many children, who experience housing or homelessness on any given night. I have personally worked at the intersection of architecture, affordable housing, and sustainability for 20 plus years. But I must say that by almost any metric, we are failing at housing as a solution. Why is this? How can we experience every day the necessity of home for ourselves, but seemingly care so little to solve the problem of housing for others? I never knew any kind of housing insecurity growing up, nor have I ever had to experience it firsthand. As a teenager, however, in the 1980s, I volunteered to serve lunches in a homeless shelter for women in Boston. I ended up working there for about two years as I witnessed the slippery slope of homelessness. Of, of homelessness. Without a home, it seems, everything else falls apart. I didn't know then what I know now, that as a country in the 1980s, we were created a heretofore unprecedented level of homelessness. By the way, for those of you born after the 1980s, it wasn't always this way. This kind of exception or this accepting that we will have people without homes is a relatively new thing in our society and certainly is not a thing in every society. Somehow now in the United States, we accept the inhumane idea that hundreds of thousands of people will live without a home. In my own life, I've experienced the opposite. I have had houses to provide for me, to heal, for, to heal me. In 2007, newly divorced and the single mother of three young daughters, I moved to the town where I had grown up to be near my family. I had help from my parents and the incredible fortune to buy a very special home. Built in 1907 and called the Scarab 
after the Egyptian beetle, which is a symbol of creativity and rebirth, by intrepid women who had built it exactly 100 years before we moved in. This house and its story, its history, the design of it, it at first sheltered me and my children, and over time became a place of love and healing. These women were Catherine Lee Bates, who wrote America the Beautiful, a professor at Wellesley College and author of about 30 books of poetry and literary criticism. Her beloved was Catherine Coleman, her partner of 25 years, a professor of history, economics, and a social justice crusader of the early 20th century. Born in the 1850s, it's amazing to think of these women living together, hiring an architect to help them build a house where domesticity met creativity in a way that was unique to them, including a third floor writing retreat called Bohemia. The design of a house is a way to design your life, your perspective, your experiences, your relationships. In 2015, I met and fell in love with a man who joined our house full of women. As we got engaged and started planning our life together, we also started renovating the third floor room, Bohemia, and in doing so, we started to design our life together. But when two months before our wedding, my fiance had a sudden and fatal heart attack on May 17, 2017, all of this took on an entirely new dimension. In the shock and devastation of sudden loss and its horrific grief, I stayed up in Bohemia and started writing. I wrote, it seemed, to save my life. Writing and grieving seemed the same to me, I wrote at that time, as I searched to find joy in the sadness and light in the cloud of gray. Over time, I felt the pull of these women and their love and their grief story. Catherine Coleman had contracted breast cancer in 1911, called cancer of the breast at the time, and died up in Bohemia in 1915. Grieving her, Bates moved up to Bohemia herself and wrote a book of poems that was called Yellow Clover. I poured over a poem that Bates wrote about Coleman in this very room where I was grieving and writing. One poem in particular called in Bohemia, a corona of sonnets. I give you joy, my dearest. Death is done, she begins. Our word shall still be joy, shall still be joy, she continues in sonnet two. In sonnet three, she writes, I could not bear my grief, but that I must. I was learning from these women in this space that they built to foster their love and creative lives that my fiance and I had built in our imagination of our lives together. Bates ends the sonnets, your sentence by my quavering voice was told. And so it was. I, I told my beloved story to publishing in Bohemia, a memoir of love, loss, and kindness. And through this writing, I learned to keep the gifts of the joy that I had experienced with him. I bore my grief the power of a house, the power of home, the power of love, the power of homemaking. And so if we know this to be true, then how do we leverage these powers beyond our personal stories into our shared narrative and our shared experience? Who amongst you has not sought the beauty of a house to nurture your soul, to raise your family, perhaps? Who amongst you would seek homelessness for yourself, or for your parents, or your children? And yet, we continue to allow poverty to be a precondition for a high quality and beautiful home to be a luxury, designed perhaps by an architect. For the past 20 years, I have endeavored to change this, working as a community architect within local community-based organizations I learned to bring design into the hands of local advocates and activists for affordable housing and community development. As a Rose Fellow, an Enterprise Rose Fellow in Charlottesville, Virginia, I had the chance to work with Piedmont Housing 
stepping in to a project in the 10th and Page Street neighborhood revitalization, a community development initiative that was already underway. I joined the Neighborhood Steering Committee, taking on the design of 31 new and rehabbed homes for mixed income home ownership, while also learning the fundamentals of project management and development finance. I worked with the Hope Community Center to rehab and build a new recreation center for the neighborhood. And after my fellowship ended, I translated that experience into the creation of the Charlottesville Community Design Center. I was learning what it meant to be a community architect. Later, as director of the Enterprise Rose Fellowship, I got to work with dozens of fellows and community-based groups around the United States, recruiting emerging architects and mentoring them on their path to being community architects. Ten of those stories are told in my book, Design with Love, at home in America. I traveled the country visiting Rose communities for over nearly 20 years. The writing of this book, though, reflects my personal perspective, and I've tried hard to represent each person's experience and aspirations authentically. In doing so, I have become increasingly aware of the problematic nature of telling other people's stories through my lens as a white person, as one who has never known discrimination, housing insecurity, or economic hardship. I could not have done so without the deep relationships and generous cooperation and support of every person featured in Design with Love. The book starts at the US-Mexico border, a town of 30,000 residents, a small town called San Isidro. San Isidro is home to the most traveled border crossing in the world. David Flores, Rose Fellow, start, sets the stage for the many stories that follow. A place, its specific cultural, geographical, and economic identity, a community group and its commitment to its people, an architectural fellow and his or her drive to seek meaning in their work and in their lives, to be useful, above all, to aspire to do better. It's a book about caring, people caring deeply and committing to the work of showing that care in built form. David moved to San Isidro in the year 2000, inspired by the work of Casa Familiar, a social service nonprofit serving residents for over 50 years. He got a chance to build Las Casitas, a project he'd helped design with quirky poster architects. He got to know the community, he listened, and he stayed. It's a complex community here in San Isidro with a host of issues that face any border community. But San Isidro was personal for David. Born in Juarez, he immigrated to the U.S. with his parents, siblings, and aunt at age nine. But when his father was arrested, incarcerated, and deported at, when David was 19, his family splintered. Some call this family separation. David calls it abandonment. He made it his life's mission to fight against what he calls community abandonment. Families are not governed by borders, he says. They are governed by love. In addition to building new affordable housing for families in need, he opened a community design center called The Front. He worked on libraries, after school centers, and parks. His firm, um, Casa Familiar, hosts over 1,000 people for Thanksgiving dinner every year. He joined the Planning Commission. He fought for the rights of pedestrians, with 30,000 people crossing on foot every day. David successfully advocated for the addition of a second pedestrian entry, and he joined the Committee of Arts to make the land port more meaningful. And given the air pollution caused by cars idling for hours as they wait in line, David joined forces with the University of Washington and San Diego State University to conduct air quality studies. Through it all, affordable housing remained a focus. And just this year, Casa Familiar opened the much anticipated living rooms at the border, a 10 unit housing development in the heart of San Isidro with the restoration of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, built in 1927, and its transformation into a performance art space called El Salon. This project, designed by uh, Teddy Cruz and Fona Foreman, 
was begun in 2000 and opened in 2020. The fight continues. The commitments remain. Being a community architect, in David's case, meant a 20-year demonstration and commitment of love. As you will read in the book itself, this essential framework repeats a place, its beauty, and its structural challenges. A people, their resilience, a fundamental care for each other, and a commitment to improving that place. This book will take you to many communities in America, some very sad, all very beautiful, with different landscapes, languages, people, different housing needs and architectural expressions. We didn't start by calling this book Design with Love, but by the time we had finished our travels, the interviews, the photography, it became clear. Love is the best way to describe the approach that community leaders take in working with their neighbors to strive for what Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King would call the beloved community, a world in which hunger, homelessness, and poverty will not be tolerated. Through our travels, it became clear that the most successful communities and the most successful architectural fellows were those that had the same shared core elements. A clear commitment to their mission, a common understanding of the philosophical and spiritual underpinnings of their work, and the tenacity to meet community goals. Or as Dr. Cornell West would say, love is what justice looks like in public. And so we come to our third book, Justice is Beauty, written by my friends and colleagues at Mass Design Group, where I am now a senior principal. Mass is a collective of over 200 architects, landscape architects, engineers, builders, furniture designers, writers, filmmakers, and researchers. We represent 20 countries across the globe. Our mission is to research, build, and advocate for an architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. We believe in expanding access to design that is purposeful, healing, and hopeful. We are incorporated as a nonprofit, uniquely positioned to leverage philanthropy, ensuring that we can serve communities in need. We work with partners in the very early stages of design to assist communities articulate their mission and set their ambitions. Our story begins in Rwanda, in East Africa, with a conversation in 2001 between Dr. Agnes Benigwahu, a Rwandan pediatrician who had returned to Rwanda in 1996 and served as Minister of Health, when she met the recently departed Dr. Paul Farmer, founder of Partners in Health, who had dedicated his life to providing what he called a preferential option for the poor. These two shared in a moral outrage that people still die of easily avoidable conditions, that being poor is a precursor for inequity and injustice. We designed the Butaro District Hospital in partner with these two and their organizations. In the Barrera District in the north of Rwanda, one of the most impoverished regions of Rwanda at the time, with 400,000 people without access to medical care. Rwanda is called Land of a Thousand Hills, and the area is incredibly beautiful. It sits at the bottom of Volcanoes National Park, home to the mountain gorilla, near the border between Rwanda, the DRC, and Uganda. The Butaro Hospital, according to Paul Farmer, needed to be more than just a health facility. It had to be a symbol of new beginnings to prosperity. Dr. Farmer understood that beauty is essential to justice and that a preferential option for the poor requires that we offer the best health care and the best architecture to the most impoverished people in our society. Rwanda is blessed with a temperate climate. Instead of having indoor waiting rooms and walkways that pose a serious threat to the spread of infectious disease, we put all of the hallways outside. Illiteracy in the region at that time was still high, but a thoughtful color, color palette for signage creates wayfinding. Fail-safe passive ventilation systems help reduce the risk of contamination from airborne infections. 
All of these lessons would become invaluable many years later when COVID came to our country. It's scientifically proven that the sight of a suffering patient slows down recovery. A simple, a simple design act of flipping the beds in the wards to offer patients a view to nature makes a significant difference in health and well-being. This hospital is a great example of what we came to call purpose-built architecture, one that is bespoke design for a particular people, place, and purpose, but also speaks to the design of healthcare delivery infrastructure in rural settings globally. It's also where we developed our low-fat philosophy, locally fabricated, investing in local materials and local craft. This volcanic rock is harvested out of fields for planting in the region. We worked with masons to invent a mortarless system, revealing the natural beauty of the stone and creating something unique. Now a thriving business for these masons. The success of Butaro led to what is now an office of over 100 people in Rwanda. And we are part of building a community of practice, architects who are rebuilding their country. This project also led to many other projects in the area. Housing for doctors who were working at the hospital. A premier oncology center, the first of its kind in the area. In Rwanda, when someone goes to the hospital, they bring their family with them. And so we needed housing for those visiting families. On the hillside across from Butaro is now the University of Global Health Equity, of which Dr. Agnes is now the leader. This is also where Paul Farmer passed last March. Our office is led by Christian Berimana, and about 70% of our uh, staff in Rwanda is from Rwanda, and others representing other countries throughout the continent, as well as the US and Canada and the UK. So much of our work has started with buildings, but the implications go much broader. The Butaro Hospital also led the Rwanda government to ask us to create new guidelines for hospital construction based on the lessons from Butaro. Our next project was the, the Munini District Hospital, a 120-bed hospital about four hours south of the capital city of Kigali. And then the Narragenge District Hospital in downtown Kigali, a hospital that immediately became the COVID hospital because it was designed according to these principles of airflow. We've done many other projects in the area, including the new African Leadership University, uh, the brainchild of uh, Fred Swanaker, who is seeking to create entrepreneurs and leaders on the continent. Interesting to think of this project um, in terms of campus design. In Africa, there's a need to educate hundreds of thousands of people at an upper level, but for the least cost, with the least amount of infrastructure. How do we create these kind of pod-like structures and buildings that can be used 24-7 practically, instead of, no offense to all of us, who went to these sprawling campuses? Very different approach. And we were so thrilled to recently open the amazing uh, new campus for the Ellen DeGeneres campus at the Diane Grilla Fosse Fund. A beautiful project up in this volcanic region. But I'm gonna share one project in greater depth with you today. RICA, the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture, as an example of a carbon positive future. Funded by the Howard Buffett Foundation and the government of Rwanda, RICA will be the first climate positive campus in the world. The majority of Rwandans depend still on subsistence agriculture. The country is the most dense rural landscape in the world. And RICA's investment in innovation in sustainable agriculture will be key to the country's health and wealth outcomes. In 1990, the country had a healthy proportion of natural forest and grassland. But you can see how this has changed in three decades. Even with 80% of the land as farmland now, 21% of the population remains food insecure. And so the innovations and um, put, shining the light on the future of farming in this country, we hope, will be invaluable. 
When we began the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture, one of our design directors in Rwanda, Noella, who was also the second licensed female architect in the country, led the immersion process, which, which began to getting to know the community around Gashora and Rurero districts, where Rika is located. We wanted the community to be an integral part of the building process, and so we spent that time engaging. We developed a richer understanding of what resources were locally available to us, mainly people's expertise and building materials. As a result, 95% of the 1,700-person labor force was hired locally. Noella wanted to show what was possible to build something beautiful with local resources while being mindful of the greater impact of construction on the environment. RICA is comprised of 69 unique buildings on, on 3,700 acres. The campus creates all of its own power and recycling and treats all of its own water. The campus is designed around a central spine, creating a walkable community. It is designed according to what we call a one health approach to imagine how human settlement can be productive and beneficial for the environment. And human, animal, and ecosystem <laughs> health are intertwined. Why focus so much right now on carbon? By questioning every single decision in the project, from the stone foundations to the timber roof, we were able to reduce the embodied carbon to 40% of business as usual. This needed a whole team, architects, engineers, furniture makers, and construction group, to research, design, and build. Most importantly, we learned along the way and continued to learn right through construction. Everything, it seemed, was a bit of an experiment. This project has been a catalyst in our organization for how we integrate embodied carbon reduction into our design process. All of the furniture for this 400 people who live there, all the 200 plus types of furniture were all made in Rwanda. We were able to knit together a network of over 85 different artisan groups making different pieces of, an, of a furniture process. The buildings are made from locally sourced stone, earth, and timber. The exposed timber roofs rely on craftsmanship as well. They reduce the embodied carbon to 10% of the typical steel roof construction. But we had some learning moments along the way, many of them. Timber construction is an important part of slowing climate change. We know that in 20 years' time, Africa will be building more than any region on Earth. And sustainably harvest wood needs to be an option. As designers, we're always making compromises, of course. And while we source most of the wood from an FSC certified forest in Rwanda, we also source wood from a forest in Tanzania, which demonstrated a growing forest stock, but wasn't yet certified. 25% of all the materials in the project are in the walls. They are predominantly made from compressed earth blocks, and some feature rammed earth walls, too. All of this earth came from the site itself. This creates this wonderful indoor environment in this humid savanna heat. Uh, you walk inside and just almost feel like a cool breeze. There's really nothing like being able to see the materials being extracted from the ground that the buildings are being built on. These two and a half meter blocks were then made on site, two and a half million blocks were made on site with 60 people making 800 blocks a day using manual presses. The only external ingredient is a small amount of cement. But another learning moment. Our engineers had demonstrated that 5% cement was enough to make sturdy blocks. But the practicality of making and storing so many blocks, especially in the rainy season, led us to increase the cement to 7%. When the during the rainy season when the durability was of highest concern. This decision reduced overall wastage, so there's no discernible change in the embodied carbon. 
About 90% of Rwandans live in earth buildings. Rika has demonstrated that this traditional material can be used to build beautiful and safe buildings, which is helping to change how it is perceived as a poor person's material. In collaboration with the government of Rwanda, we have just completed the earth construction guidelines to inform future housing developments. And we're on the front page of the newspaper just yesterday. Through the use of materials such as earth, we have reduced emissions. This is the first and perhaps most important step, but doing less harm is not gonna keep the biggest impacts of climate change at bay. We know we need to both remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We need to also be regenerative. At RICA, we have planted 40 hectares of native savanna forest, which will sequester enough carbon to mean that we hope that the campus will be positive by 2040. We know that our future is going to look different than our past, no matter what we do or don't do. But Christian Mana, the leader of our Kigali office, has said, we are not architects to build buildings. We are architects to protect and save our planet, to improve the communities in which we live, and awaken the ties that bind us inextricably to one another. Some said that this could not be done in the United States, but we are motivated by our staff, each of whom demonstrates a relentless commitment to understanding why we do what we do. We invite all of our staff to step into and define their personal purpose for doing this professional work. The young architects amongst us know. They know, you know, that the situation is urgent. You know that change is essential that architecture cannot continue the way it is if we are gonna have a planet to build on. Our team in the US has been stepping in to this call. In the US, we are structured around some of the most pressing issues of our time. We are primarily building a methodology, a purpose-built process that allows us to engage in partners in meaningful ways. We spoke earlier about this kind of methodology before. It starts with understanding what the core mission is of a project. Who are the people that you are trying to serve? What is the mission in, that you are serving them with? How do you set goals and outcomes that you seek to strive for through your architecture? And how do you commit to measuring your success at the end, long after the building is built? Building a building, like making a movie or anything, is a notoriously complex process. It takes a long time, an enormous amount of money and resources. Divided up into about a trillion steps, and those steps becoming increasingly segregated. The involvement of the architect is typically limited just here to the design and construction phases. And if we're lucky, maybe just a tiny bit of planning and a minor involvement in construction. But most often, that is long after the most important questions about a project's fundamental impact have been asked and answered. Here's your program. By whom and for whom? Who decides that program? What do we need to get there? How do we measure our success? At Mass, we don't take any of this for granted. We are constantly expanding the involvement of the architect. In our goal, we would be available to partners in the earliest process and stay long after the work is done, the upstream stuff. This is the groundwork of architecture. In the US, we are building healthcare as well. Our best known project here is around our public memory and memorial work. We learn so much from our Rwandan counterparts about what it means to face a horrible past and to do it honestly with an eye to healing. The National Memorial for Peace and Justice seeks to acknowledge and confront the facts of our history, our stories, and how our collective narrative shaped our past, present, and future. The single greatest work of architecture in the 21st century will break your heart. Soon we'll be opening in Boston a new uh, dedication to the legacy of both Mar Martin Luther and his wife, Coretta Scott King, who met and married in Boston. We honor the love that they had for each other through this beautiful 
sculpture and landscape designed in partnership with Hank Willis Thomas. It's called The Embrace. We work with partners of all different types. These are two moms who came down to the Memorial for Peace and Justice and cornered one of our principals and said, we need a memorial for our sons, those who are killed every day by gun violence. Here's a case where there's no site, no program, no particular client, except for a couple of moms in their small organization called Purpose Over Pain. How do we as architects understand how we respond to this kind of call back in these essentials, these questions of love and grief. This has become our proposal of a memorial that captures not just the numbers. Each of these houses has 700 spaces, which are the, the number of people who are killed by gun violence every week in this country, but also provides an opportunity to tell those stories and share in the love. After COVID hit, it was very interesting to start applying that COVID knowledge here in the United States. We took that knowledge to a variety of different engagements. And on our website, there are about a dozen um, downloads for free for COVID guidelines, designing for COVID guidelines. This one was targeted at seniors. We know that seniors were suffering the most from the effects of COVID. And we sought to understand how to create, um, how to think about COVID guidelines that wouldn't just keep them separate. For seniors, actually, even during COVID, they were at greater risk of their health from social isolation than they were from COVID itself. People 65 years and over. This is the public health we talked about a little bit earlier up in studio, right? Understanding the population you're trying to serve and what is the impact that you're trying to have. So we went through this process with this first project called JJ Carroll, which is currently under construction in Brighton, Massachusetts, with a wonderful partner called Two Life Communities. The places that we make to make them purposeful, understanding how to design, in this case, around the growing number of seniors in Boston, but understanding how to divide up the building into neighborhoods and create, instead of this sort of double loaded corridor, create these kind of pods and neighborhoods. You're gonna see how we did this in New York. We're hoping, this is um, confidential since we haven't gotten this project yet. You can cross your fingers with me. Um, but we're really hoping to build this in uh, the Weeksville neighborhood of Brooklyn with a call for 200 senior residential units. You'll see how here we started with the sort of typical double-loaded corridor scheme, the sort of efficiency instinct that we come to in most housing, multifamily housing projects. But we integrated this process of dividing it into neighborhoods and then pulling it apart into these three neighborhoods and separating it, introducing the opportunity for light and air to flow between these neighborhoods and social spaces in between so that you could form a neighborhood within your 200 unit housing project. We're always interpreting different styles and architectural language of the neighborhood, in this case, the NYCHA campus. I'd like to think that we don't necessarily have a particular style, actually that each of our projects responds to a people and a place. I'm gonna wrap up here, and I want to just, I guess, end with this quote by Craig Wilkins, who I think is one of the greatest architectural writers of our time. He says, theory without practice has no value, Practice with no theory, if practice without theory has no purpose, and either without responsibility has no place in architecture. I hope that you all will join me in this call for homemaking, for turning our architecture into a thing of personal meaning that has political significance in a way that we desperately need it to, to go forward.
thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate it. It was a quote, uh, beauty is essential for justice. Could you explain, expand, expand on that a bit more? Or like how is beauty essential for justice? Yeah, oh, I'd love to. Um, if any of you have seen um, the full cover of that book, the book has um, beauty and justice. And in the middle it says, and, or, is. Right? Do you choose beauty or justice? And I think part of that was coming out of the generation of architects that I grew up with. When I was young in the field, the work that I was doing was considered wholly second rate. The idea was that there was architecture, and then there was community architecture. And community architecture was second rate, that form and beauty was the thing that was most important in architecture and defined it, in fact. And so for me and many of my colleagues, we tried to understand that beauty without justice is not beautiful by any metric that we would ascribe to it. What good does a beautiful building do if it isn't impacting either the planet or the neighborhood um, negatively. So I think that this idea, it's hard to break down. We don't like to use words like the poor, right? We don't say those words. Paul Farmer was not scared of that. He had traveled the country. He lived for many years between Haiti and Boston and traveling. And so he came very close to understanding what life was like for the poor. And understanding that in Boston, if you were there and you wanted to get the best class medical treatment in the world, it was available and you could pay for it. But if you lived in an impoverished society or lived in Haiti, that medical treatment was expected to be substandard. And so the question about why that is, you know, I actually, I think you guys are going to have Sierra Brainbridge here in the spring. And I was just talking to her about her experience at Butaro because she was on the ground building that project and working hand in hand with Paul while she was doing it. And he was obsessed by the garden, obsessed by the view. If the building wasn't going to be beautiful, he wasn't going to build it. I think we think that a hospital, if you got the program for a hospital, X number of square feet of this, X number of square feet of that, that's a program, right? That tells you, like, what do you need in order to provide the provision of spaces which will allow for the distribution of medical services. But it's very different than designing a building that is, in its architecture, striving to heal the patient, the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, the families who visit. Right? So understanding, I think, a building through its program is very different than understanding a building through its mission. And Paul taught us that. That if you weren't going to build a building, to a hospital, not for the provision of health, but to make people healthier, it's different. And that the beauty of that building was integral to people's well-being, their healing, and their sense of dignity. Yes, please. This model is a really compelling vision for, for many of us here. Oh, one wonders about the, how is the model, are others adopting the model? Do you see you have a network of other firms that are actually pursuing something akin to what you're doing? 
I wish I could tell you there were more. <laughs> it's really interesting. You know, sometimes when we say, like, oh, we're a nonprofit, the architects be like, oh, 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 we're a nonprofit too. Right? Like, there's this idea in architecture, like, we don't make much money, right? But it couldn't be more different, right? I mean, the idea, I think the model of being a nonprofit, I mean, it's not, listen, it's not perfect. But the idea of saying that, number one, the outcome is never the building. It's the success of the mission of the building. So you're not there to just deliver on the construction of the building. You're there to deliver on the promise that the building makes to create some kind of social outcome for the people in it. And that, you know, for better or worse, in this country, we have this thing called profits and nonprofits, and we have this thing called philanthropy. I mean, that's maybe messed up. We could talk about that another day. But being able to use philanthropy to make sure that we're able to work with people in the early stages. Very few um, for profit companies want to hire architects to do the early, early, early stage visioning. And what we find with nonprofit partners is that they don't, you, you, they're only going to build one building potentially in their lifetime. Let's say you're a community theater. You're not going to build six community theaters in Muncie, you're going to build one. So you need to go through this whole process. How do you work with an architect? How do you even know you need a building? How do you go through this process? So we like to work with people up in the early stages. It's been a model that's worked really well for us. We're able to use philanthropy to work with partners who couldn't afford to work with us otherwise, to invest in our own research and design capabilities. When COVID hit and we set on those COVID guidelines, we didn't think twice. Did we think who's going to pay us for the hundreds of hours to respond to COVID? No. We were like, we'll figure it out. You know, but it's our duty to take our knowledge and dig in and respond to our partners who are asking, but others. So I wish I could tell you. I thought, you know, we won Firm of the Year this year, which is amazing. And I hope what that signals is that the AIA and the community of architecture will look more closely at our model and evolve it, like do better. But don't do worse or don't do the same without pausing to ask the question that we're fundamentally trying to ask, which is like, how do we make architecture more relevant? How do we serve more people? How do we become a bigger part of the solution? How do we not defend our territory, but rather expand it? I have a couple of questions up in the back. Yes, hi. Hi. <laughs> Someone raised their hand at the beginning, so I'll ask a question. Okay. As you've probably been made aware during your visit, and, or maybe prior, we started a program in social and environmental justice for undergraduate and graduate students with an undergraduate minor and a graduate certificate in social and environmental justice. And it has been somewhat difficult to alum, to, to some students, to others, um, to see the relevance of social environmental justice to architecture, to design, to landscape architecture, and urban planning. And we'd like to know what your thoughts are on or what words of encouragement you may have for students. How many of us are pursuing that minor in social environmental justice or that certificate? How many of you think environmental justice is going to be important to your future? How many of you think that the current like, state of our economy and economics are sustainable for the people of our country? Zero. Yeah, I, I, I mean, congratulations and bravo. And we need these programs. But it also has to be integrated into every single studio. Is there someone in the room who doubts this, actually? You doubt it. Uh, no, not, no, not doubt. I thought you were going to buzz and I was about to say Professor Keogh does yeah. social environmental justice. I haven't had the studio yet, but I hear he does certain stuff like 
Yeah, I think that in terms of the pedagogy, um, you know, listen, I've been here for a few hours. It seems awesome. I've had such a good visit. I've already met many of you. It's been really welcoming. I'm so happy to be here, and I congratulate you on everything you're doing. And also, if you haven't asked some of these questions, we chatted around the coffee in the, in the nook about a few things. We, ch we chatted around interdisciplinary collaboration, which is a fact of life, but not a fact of studio. I was talking about this project, Rika. Um, architecture record, just, you're going to read a lot about Rika. You should read more. There's a lot to learn from that project. Architecture record just did a big spread on it. Um, so then it's time, well, like, who's the architect? You know, everyone loves, like, a star architect, right? So we gave them the names of the architects involved in the design. There were 69 from our office. They printed them all. We made them. I'm like, otherwise, don't, don't do the article. But what did we not print? The 22 engineers and the 150 furniture makers and the 2,000 person construction team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Architecture is a shared endeavor. And the whole purpose of defining a kind of mission, which has to include ecological, social, outcomes is that without having a North Star, you can't possibly collaborate with all those people and get to something that is performing at a level like this. You cannot do it. You can't do it alone. So I, I would heartily encourage that we never build anything that's carbon messed up, right? Like we just... Why build at this point? Like, do we need more buildings? Bad buildings? Like, we have a lot of bad buildings. I don't think we need any more. So I think that, you know, I congratulate you on having a minor or a major, but I would, and I'm sure you're already doing this, but I would heartily encourage you to integrate that perspective because if, if you, the faculty, don't need it in your lifetimes, your students are going to need it desperately in their careers, in their lifetimes. So, I'd, yeah. Okay, Charlie. I just, I just want to say, uh, but Olin stepped out here, but I am very happy to say that I think that almost all of our faculty are really teaching that at the core of everything. That uh, we, have a, we have a great systems core here uh, who, who get us on the, the right page with um, the sort of ecological background, global warming, and all the things that we can do to help it. Um, and also all the social background. It, it really is a, a solid part. And uh, you know, you, you, you've been here for, for a day so far. And, I, I'm very thankful to be in this program for the five years that I've heard. Uh, I love it. And as I said, congratulations on everything you're doing. And I'll throw a flavor too. It's okay. Yes. Um, to transfer this to the to the office, um, you know, the, I, I urged everyone uh, in audience development to take a look at the website and especially look at the picture that you showed earlier of the team. It, it's an amazing view of, of you know, a, a, an extremely interesting place. Can, can you bring that down to a, a project? How does the team of, of this amazingly diverse group of faces, how do they work on a, a small project? What, what's, you know, you were talking about, you know, our inability to, to cross-disciplinary teach or learn. Which is a problem. Uh, I, I'm just wondering how, how that works in, the, in an office kind of setting on a project. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think um, it's, it's absolutely been a rare and kind of incredible experience to watch the development of the architecture field in Rwanda. 
So, and I know um, Gio Doné maybe is here. Is he here? He's from Rwanda. I met him earlier. Okay, so you can correct me if I, if I misspeak at any time. I believe he was a graduate of a program there um, called the Kigali Institute of Science and Technology, which was founded in 2009. So it was the first time there was a school of architecture in 2009. I spoke earlier about Christian Benimana. He was educated in China, had to learn Mandarin to uh, learn architecture. Uh, Noella, who I mentioned, she went to school in South Africa. And both coming home to really not only like to build a new profession. So there are now about 150 people in the Rwanda Institute of Architecture. And it's a different kind of environment, I think, where you can kind of see and watch buildings come together. Maybe in a way that we used to experience. I'm not sure if, it, if any of you in your lifetime kind of were the kind of architect who felt like you were on site, like making decisions and building with materials that you put in your hands. Um, so it's a, it's a different kind of environment. Having an engineering team in our office, on our team, has been integral to that. Having a film team, you know, we use film not only to talk about the work or for like marketing reasons, but we use it for engagement reasons as well. Our recent library project in New Lots, our first deliverable was a short video around the culture and the place of New Lots in Brooklyn. So I think, you know, I mean, all architecture is collaboration. And I think in the profession in the US, sometimes the architect is, wow, most of what you do is organize the consultants, right? Um, so I think for us, it's been, we've been very lucky to be influenced by a kind of environment where our, our people have been in the office and on site, um, where we have all the disciplines in the office and on site, and where we're seeking to kind of achieve shared goals. The carbon work is really wonky and technical. And, you know, we have a team that's kind of also dedicated to working with every project team to evaluate where they are headed through their design in terms of like carbon. You can't do it otherwise. You can't do it at the end. So we're trying to organize ourselves well to bring the research expertise of some of our staff to the benefit of all of our projects too and teach along the way. Um, it gets messy, but I think it's been, it's been really interesting. And it's really interesting also to feel like you're, like you're watching a profession get built, which here in the States, we have like 100,000 or so architects, or 100,000 members of the AIA at least. Um, it feels kind of established, but there it feels new. And that opens up some possibilities to rethink things, which is, which is pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about the newness of working in Rwanda. Uh, how would you approach the establishment of the U.S. or everywhere else? Yeah. I mean, I think that's been, you know, I, I, I sort of said it like, people, well, you can do that in Africa, you know. So we're trying hard to do it here. And I think the Memorial for Peace and Justice was an incredible sort of demonstration that, yeah, we didn't use the same process, but we brought the same, a lot of the same core values, right? In that case, the Equal Justice Initiative, led by Brian Stevenson and his very well-established and incredibly talented team, had done years of research and understanding about not only about the reality of lynching in America, which had not been shared knowledge, 
when they started, when we started working with them, they had found the names of about 4,400 people who had been lynched, none of whose stories were told. Now I think that number is over 5,000. But you know, being able to work with them in the very early stages to try to help them understand what would a building do for their mission. Their mission is not to build a building. Their mission is to end racial terrorism. And their method is to make sure that people understand that the racial terrorism of the past, as expressed through slavery and lynching, is still showing up in other forms in terms of like mass incarceration and other things today. So they have a larger mission. And the building and the memorial and the museum, which we didn't design, but it's amazing that accompanies it, and many other strategies are their strategies to try to get to their mission. So I hope that we've started to demonstrate that you, know, you can commit to some core methodology, even in different contexts. And you know, it's going to look different. It's going to feel different. It's going to be built differently. But there are things we can learn. Um, I can personally testify to the lynching memorial one. I actually learned about that sophomore year of high school when we were doing a whole entire um, segment on lynching. Uh, and so I specifically remembered that memorial because it looked very unique and very it was very interesting. And so when I found out you guys are the ones who designed it, I'm like, oh, that's very interesting. But that testament to what they were trying to get at is starting to show itself up in schools. Yeah, great. Right, and that's, that's the success. Like, you're learning that in high school. And, you know, even um, two years ago, there was new anti-lynching legislation. Yeah, so if you can imagine that, like, our world, right? So, you know, those are the effects that you want, right? And... I mean, those are big effects to ask for, I guess. But why, why else are we here, right, than actually to try to use the integrated thinking, to use the ability to um, understand how to navigate systems, to diagram, to draw, to see, to understand the interrelatedness of all these things. This is what you're learning, right? And so what is the problem that you're trying to solve with your education? Is it designing a building? Yeah, maybe. But is it actually trying to identify, help tease out and solve the larger problems that maybe a building or a landscape or a city plan or a recycling program or a bicycle program, who knows what the solution might be? But the education that you're receiving here, and I love like just seeing on the doorway coming in, like all the disciplines that are here. So the more that you're able to integrate all of those incredible skills that you're learning that, and that your colleagues are learning, because they will be your partners. So um, thank you for all the questions, and thank you for having me, and um, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.